Okay, so on to Brigitte, um, who I've known to be an, an inspiring thinker um, about animation um, and a, a, a strong practitioner and also um, a great teacher. Um, yeah, so she's written um, a lot of uh, very interesting articles and books on animation. And I, I think I've got it right, is that you conceived, or at least you ran with the term expanded animation, which is something which um, is very present in Brigitte's own practice. Um, so we've always, always had expanded cinema since the 60s and 70s. Um, and Brigitte, I think, maybe you do. I don't off. think I coined the oh, term, you but you I was an early adopter. I was an early adopter. Um, so tonight you'll get a sense of how um, the term expanded animation plays out in Brigitte's practice. Um, and, uh, and some of her single screen work as well. So uh, what, what we're going to do is Brigitte's going to talk through um, her processes um, as well as show the finished films. Um, and because of wanting to talk about the working process, um, she's going to use PowerPoint to sort of deliver that. Um, With films in between, just to show photographs. Yeah. And then we're going to have, um, uh, after her own work, and um, that of Barbara Hammer and um, Stan Brackage, mm. we're going to have a short break. Um, because then there's a sort of change of register where we'll go into a sort of participatory performance. Um, but during that short break, we'll also do a bit of a QA. and a I might ask Brigitte a few questions, and you might also want to ask her some questions too. And then we'll go into Len Lai, and then we'll, you will all make an animation for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Um, enjoy it. Did you want to say anything right now? First, no. first time? No. Should we open the curtain? Yeah. You've got to say open curtains. <laughs> 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 so, our projectionist has a bit of a difficult job because yeah. there's a, a mixture of digital films, um, a PDF, and a lot of films on celluloid. <laughs> 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 for me my work is very process based um, I think of it as a field of activities not just one single output so I wanted to give a sense of um, rather than just showing the films I wanted to give a sense of the drawings and the performances and the other things that I've done that go into these final works because um, yeah it's all about process so I'm going to talk about um, <coughs> drawing performance and also um, this sense of the microcosm within the body, how that connects to the macrocosm of the body politic. So if we can go to the first slide, please. I've actually got a very old friend of mine in the audience here from back in the day. <laughs> and um, what I originally studied was drama and film. And um, I went on to do theatre design and I originally made costumes and props and models and designed theatre sets and, and um, I had a lot of fun. I never had any money at all, but I had a really good time and did things on the shoestrings. But unfortunately, at that time, a virus was plaguing in my community. And one by one, friends of mine started to catch AIDS. And um, I was a volunteer for the Terence Higgins Trust and this is one of the things we did. It was a float for London Lighthouse at the Notting Hill Carnival in the days of creating awareness about safer sex. So we would be handing out condoms. My friend John on the left designed the float and I did the costumes. And um, why this is relevant to my story is because while I was a volunteer at the Terence Higgins Trust in the office, 
I learned something called Word Star. And Word Star is so old, it's before Word. It's a really old computer program. And so I learned Word Star in the office as a volunteer. And I just got really interested in computers. And um, so my best friend John ended up dying, which was you know, very upsetting. If we go to the next slide. And so this um, really affected me. And um, I became very interested in the idea of the virus. Um, not just as a, as a physical thing, but the idea of uh, psychological epidemics. So at this time, we had not only prejudice against people with AIDS, but we also had Section 28, and also weird fears, like all computers are going to crash in the year 2000, society so will come to an end. So there was all these kind of conspiracies and paranoid ideas that were spreading like viruses. So I was interested in the virus, as a metaphor, as well as the actual virus that was killing my friends. So I did a lot of work about this. I did performances, I did uh, installation. Uh, some of these were at the Globe Centre, which is a centre for people with AIDS. So if you go on to the next slide. And so um, having had this background in performance, so I was working in theatre and working on films and started to get interested in installations. I then went back to college and I did a foundation course in computing and fine art and then I went on and did an MA in computer animation. Because as I said I'd been involved in AIDS activism, I was really um, you know, affected by these things that were happening to my community. So my graduation film was called Virus. And it was very much um, about the idea that prejudice <coughs> might spread like an epidemic. So this was made in 1999, which is like, how many years ago is that now? 24 <laughs> years ago. So this is actually quite an early version of After Effects I used. I combined um, glitches when my um, printer went wrong that I scanned in and animated. I combined um, painting on Super 8 film. I combined... Um, uh, landscapes, sort of science fiction landscapes that I built in 3D Studio Max that were based on the HIV virus, mixed in with video footage and compositing. So it's, it looks slightly ropey today, but at that time it was um, quite experimental. So if you could play the first film, please, virus.
to their presentation. So, um, looking at all these ideas about hand painting on film, the body, and so I thought what would be interesting to look at next is um, a, a more contemporary film by P. Starr called Heaven. And this um, also combines different methods to make comments about contemporary bodies. So on the next slide, it's just the title of the film. Yeah. So um, this combines digital and analog filmmaking techniques with hand-painted animation and poetry. And again, there's um, an interest in, in the volatility of the queer and uh, body. So you can stream this film as a digital So it's a more contemporary film looking at some of those the themes that I looked at in the I'm um, really sorry, but I've got that down on the list as being 16 mil, so I haven't got a digital copy as far as I know. Oh! Is it 16 mil? We haven't got a 16 mil version of that, no. We, have, we, have, we, haven't, got, we haven't got it then. Um, we'll just move on then. Just move on. Okay, I'll, I'll see if I can sort it in your break. Okay. I thought that was um, digital. Anyway. <coughs> The point was that it was just going to show you a, a more contemporary take that someone else had done. Okay, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. We can just move on. Should we go to the next slide? Okay, so, um, so I've worked in theatre and film and performance and design and I've started to get into installation. Uh, designing spaces, designing costumes and models and so forth. And then I'd gone into computer animation. So I felt like this person who was a jack of all trades and didn't know anything well. And um, then all of a sudden it hit me that what I was an expert at was where these two worlds met. And so I decided to do a PhD in animation as performance at Central St. Martins. And I basically experimented with the very concept of what animation is and whether it might be a form of performance, whether it could be live, was the animator a performer, I looked at all these different subjects and this is when I started to think about my work as expanded animation, sometimes I also called it post-animation because I felt like I was working in a post-medium practice rather than specifically just animation. So if you go on to the next slide please. And so uh, one of the things that I've been doing is drawing performances. So to me, this is linked with animation, and I'll explain that more a bit. But um, this is one of the projects that I did during lockdown. I started to think about this old work I've been doing about viruses and infections, and we were all under quarantine. And so I started to do drawings, which to me were about manifesting the routes of transmission between people that were leading to the outbreak of the pandemic. And I was thinking about how we you know, go from person to person. And um, this is a performance that I did in basically in my backyard in the sub-basement. And at the time we, we couldn't go out anywhere, we couldn't do th anything, as you'll remember. But all of a sudden we became connected online. So I became part of this uh, performance art um, event, which was run by artists from Karachi. But uh, because, yeah, normally I wouldn't be able to go to Karachi and do my performance there, but because we were all connected online, we were able to do these uh, whole series of performances and really communicate across countries with ideas of how we felt being cooped up in the quarantine. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And so um, performance drawing is part of what I do, and for me, it's very linked with animation. I sometimes think that what I'm doing is drawing into time and drawing into space, and, and rather than being boxed in by sort of preconceived ideas about what animation is. Together with three friends, 
we collaboratively wrote this book, Performance Drawing New Practices, since 1945. And we've done a lot of different uh, drawing performances together uh, as a collective. And we also work uh, singly. So if we just move on to the next slide. So when I was doing my PhD, I was very interested in animation as a concept. What does it mean to be animated? Me as a person, might I be being animated by the society I live in? And um, I got interested in how basically women are animated by conventional ideas about how women sh a woman should behave. So we take ideas from society, from ideology, and they start to form our body and the way we move and the way we behave. And I was very interested in um, Hollywood actresses and how they behave and present as being very influential markers of how females are supposed to behave. And um, I'm completely obsessed with a film called Sunset Boulevard from 1950. I can talk about it for hours and hours and hours, but I was specifically interested in the performance of Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond and the gestures that she makes and how she appears to be monstrous. And, and it's very interesting to me. So I took a line from the end of the film and I animated this doll to speak the line as a kind of a pastiche of Sunset Boulevard. So I could, it was an ex experiment just for me, for myself, just to test out this idea of performing for a camera and how I wouldn't behave. If you could play the next digital film, Sunset Blackyard. but actually it's the journalists because she's murdered her lover and um, he's pretty mean to her so yeah, you're kind of on the side of the world. So um, I became obsessed with that line from the film because to me it really encapsulated this feeling of being female, of being surveilled, of being in front of a camera, of having to perform for the public. And um, next slide please. And I wanted to really experiment with the idea of performance and animation and I wanted to create um, an experience in which there was multiple levels of performance and multiple levels of animation. So in the background was um, a projection screen and the projection screens attached to a, a DV camera which shows a live feed of what's going on but there's a very slight delay there's two TV sets that show pre-recorded um, footage. There's me sitting in the middle, and instead of having a face, I have a paper bag over my face, and my face is replaced with that doll, but cut up now, deconstructed, and um, really sort of rhythmically um, investigating that line. And next slide, please. So we thought of this, next slide, so I thought of this as, as, a, as a living sculpture. So I was becoming, at once, I was the animator, but I was also being animated by the lines from the film because I would re-perform the actions that um, Gloria Swanson would do um, when performing Norma Desmond. But I'd re-perform re them kind of um, deconstructed and hysterically. So I'd re-perform her actions. So I was being animated by the film but my presence was being replaced by an animation. So you have animator, animated, it all became mixed up. You also have the live and the mediated, so all these different levels of presence. And um, this is the first time that I did it in the Lethby Gallery, if you go to the next slide. But um, I went on to 
perform it in a number of peep shows, and this is the only way that I would show it now, because I much prefer it. And this is the one that I did in New York. And um, basically, you peep through a little peep show, and you think, because it's a peep show, you're going to see something a bit hot and sort of salacious, but actually what you see is a kind of a nightmare. And um, I really like that idea. <coughs> so, um, if you want to um, play the next film, that is the documentation from the first performance of Out There in the Dark that I did in the looking at performativity, how we perform the identity of different roles that we're given in society. And um, I'm also um, interested in the other way around, how society um, impacts on us and forms the material reality of our bodies. So as I said in this piece, there's all these multiple layers of time. There's pre-recorded, there is animated, there's live action, there's mediated, and there's live presence. So thinking about these different ideas about time, I thought it would be interesting to look at Barbara Hammer's film, Bent Time, which is on celluloid. And um, this film I've chosen so that we can think about the subjectivity of time and um, you know, just as I said, different registers of time. And it also links to the idea of the travel of which I'm going to have later on. So you can see that Barbara Hammer and yeah, just the idea that time might be spent.
to run that now. So, so let's show that now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A white blotch briefly flashes on a black screen. The background flickers like an old film reel. It changes to blue, white numbers appear, counting three upwards, then lettering the words shuddering across screen. Tell me you want to die. Who am I all this way? Can't tell you no, my big 
box injury, six types of metal in your body, Evangelion, kiss you only, tell me no, pee baby, tell me everything, what's a time machine, what's marriage, what's eating you, what's done it, what does heaven do? Of the invisible labour, 
uh, through performance and I made a number of um, works on paper and also animated installations for a solo exhibition in Korea. I don't have time to show any of the other works, but if you go to the next slide, please. Um, it included a three-minute animation that I made um, that the exhibition is named after. Next slide, please. And so having done all these drawings, having done all this thinking, going, you know, making these performances, I was able to really think through um, this film. It all came out, it all sort of came to a culmination in this film. And it helped me to work with my composer, Jose Macabro, it helped me to work with him on deciding what the sound was going to be like. And next slide, please. And, um, and um, so in the next slide, please. Is there... Oh, yeah. So, um, and so this is the text that I wrote, repetitive actions and the textures of ink, bleach and other cleaning products are used to reanimate the labour of domestic work performed by many generations of women, yet invisible and forgotten. So we felt like I was reanimating the um, labour of these people. And I actually showed this work um, in a factory in China to a whole load of former factory workers. And um, I thought they would think that I was crazy again, but they actually really got it and they liked it. So that was interesting. So if you could now show this film, please, Erasure. <coughs> And the reason I wanted to show this 
is um, to sort of think about this tradition of abstract animation, which is kind of cosmic and transcendental, and it's about um, outer space and meditation. So, to show an example, Stella by abstract um, animation, this sort of cosmic journey through the galaxy type thing. If you go to the next slide, please. And um, I was asked to create um, an installation for this gallery in Vienna. And it's, in, it's got a triangle window at the side and a square window at the front. It's a kind of a box within a shopping centre that you walk through to get to the main museum streets in Vienna. If you go to the next slide, please. So what I proposed to do was to turn the whole gallery, or the one before, to turn the whole gallery into a peep show, so that you could look through the 
the whole, and, it, and you can see that the textures in the paper comes from um, the rosary drawings, and it's flashing back and forth. The whole so it comes from the rosary drawings. This idea of. Can we go to the next slide then? <laughs> next slide. Oh, yeah. So um, the idea was to build a kind of um, a space, a spatial experience in which you looked through a peep show and at the end of it you'd see an abstract animation that looked a bit like you were journeying through the body. So my idea was to take this idea of the, the sort of cosmic journey but to make it more bodily and visceral as if you were travelling through the, the passages of somebody's body. So I did a lot of, you know, I did actually hundreds of research drawings and um, the project got cancelled by 18 months because of the pandemic so it would have been something I'd have probably just pushed around in After Effects and worked it out in a couple of months but I had, I had like a whole extra more than a year to work on it and um, it was pandemic um, I was on my own in the studio a lot of the time and um, as you know we all went a bit crazy and um, so I turned back to traditional animation. I got the oil pastels out, I started to, um, to, to draw slowly, to enjoy the touch of the oil pastels, to animate liquids, so I animated milk and ink, and just to, to start working with real substances again. And um, I felt like I was doing slow animation. So before, as I said, I was used to doing computer animation, doing frames quite quickly. Now I was taking up to 30 minutes to draw each frame, which to me seemed insane. But in the context of the pandemic, it was very reassuring. If you go to the next um, slide. So each frame that I drew, um, it was like I wanted to hold on to it. I wanted to hold on to the experience of touch. And I don't know if anyone has, has read um, Laura Mulvey's book Death 24 Frames a Second, but she talks about this pensive frame, this frame you just want to hold on to and not let go of. So um, I'll show the film now, but so you imagine that it's designed to be seen in this context of the peep show. So there's the layers of black paper going back in depth. So you're right at the back of the peep show you're seeing this film. That's the context it's supposed to be seen in. If you can screen hold now.
Maybe I won't because I think the thing that's possibly going to be more fun or interesting is the um, yeah, dot dot dash. What, Unless anyone has questions they want to ask the Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, go on. Um, yeah, I just want to ask about how this relationship works between you and the, the sounded designers and the composers. I've been really lucky to find some really amazing sort of um, DJ type. So Jose Macabro, who I've worked with, is, um, does a lot of techno and DJs in a lot of clubs. Right. So I've worked with him on a couple of projects before. So we knew each other quite well. So um, I finished the film first and then he made the sound afterwards. I sort of told him what I wanted, we discussed it, and then he <coughs> gave me something. I said, oh, let's go over the top, and then he sort of totaled it down for me, and that's, that was good. Um, and that, then to be, I don't know if you know who she is, but she used to be in Chicks and Stage, and she does, does a lot of performance and really amazing music. So we talked a lot about touch and materiality, and so she tried to make all the sounds herself with her own voice. We tried to, she made these really kind of guttural sounds that would sound like they were coming from the body, and as well as using like liquids and um, things that she touched. So we worked a lot with that, and then we just put a few beats over the top just to tie it together. But yeah, I really like working with um, really cool experimental sound. <coughs> just so, so on that. To be able to do that. Yeah, nice. And you reach out to I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of like vaguely new them, so I asked them. Yeah, um, because of the performance, I also um, um, shown us the recorded performance. So when you perform, you don't really know how exactly, it's like how viewers are perceiving because you are a performing body. So after seeing the recorded performance, does your idea of like how you wanna, um, does it change or do you like, I don't know, like how does it, does that recorded performance affect your performance, like on you, how you think of it? So that's a really good question, sort of, you know, are you performing for the camera or are you performing for, yeah. you know, another yeah. reason. So that's a, that's a really big thing with them. Mm -hmm. Performance, you know, is it about the documentation? For me, I'm very much into process because I do a lot of yoga and meditation. I'm really into being in the moment and the process. So I try not to do it for the documentation. But obviously there are times when I use things like mirrors or I plan things out. So I get a sense of what it would look like visually. You know, have another performance. The one, the one you saw there out there in the dark, I have somebody with a follow spot who puts a projector on the projection is always in the right place. So I've got someone helping me. And then obviously I look at photos and, and um, position myself. I mean, I, did a, I do another performance that I, I have an actual mirror that no one can see. So I can line myself up with the projections. But yeah, so I do try and do it in the moment, but it is, I'm trying to create a picture or a living sculpture. So. It is important to me what it looks like, but to me it's about using your own body, your own physical presence as a material, as something you're experimenting with. Well then when you document it, it kind of breaks that. Mm -hmm. So, um, like when you see it, it's not like it's have you also done performance with just for the camera? Um, <coughs> 
not really. I'm more interested in the live situation, the spontaneity of that. But then, it, then I usually do document it. Well, I guess the one I showed you, the infection drawing, was for the camera because that was for Facebook Live. But usually it's um, not for the camera. But yeah, no, it's an interesting question and something that's, you know, very shortly you're all going to do a performance for me. <laughs> Don't worry, it will be fine. Any other questions? You can ask me things afterwards. If you want. Well, just one um, thing, because we've got Len Lai coming up, and um, I'm figuring that some of you are animators, and you will have heard of Len Lai. Um, and so it's just this thing of... Um, it, it, you know, Lai is known for talking about how he um, was fascinated with movement, um, but he didn't want to represent it through sort of natural forms like clouds and so on. He wanted to, um, it was important for him to sort of get in touch with his own feelings and then communicate that through actions directly onto film. Um, and uh, I was then thinking about how, in the performance that's about to happen, um, you've sort of expanded that idea um, so that there'll be a number of us. Yeah, I'll be directing you all <coughs> to perform. Uh, don't give away the plot too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's still no way of saying what it looks like. Yeah. But we're going to watch Learn Life first to give you a context of the sort of. I do, the inspiration for that kind of work. Mm. And just to say that the copy of the film that we got was damaged, and so there's three seconds missing from the beginning because the sprocket holes are damaged, is that correct? Yeah, roughly, yeah. So it might start a little bit abruptly, and that's just because it was damaged. So sh unless there's any other questions, we'll, get up, we'll watch the live, and then, which is just a few minutes long, isn't it? Yeah. And then we'll um, do the performance. Yeah. And we could just go as directors. Good to document that Thank you. 
down to the front and I will give you a laser pin. Now there is a health and safety warning that they are not to go in the projector and they're not to go in anyone's eyes. So if you want to come down to the front <coughs> and do a laser pin.
Squiggle. 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 Okay, now only red. Squiggle red. Squiggle red. Squiggle red. Now add the other colours. Add the other colours. Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> now this time what we're going to do is get into two groups. So the group on the left follow one instruction, the group on the right follow the other instruction. And I'd like you to also copy what I'm saying. So we'll start with the group on my right over here. So group on the right, so I'll say dot, then you say dot, okay? Dot, dot, dot.